Sophie Hardy and the Battle of the Myriad by M. R. Dale. Narrated by Leona Hall. Chapter 28. Justice. Yasmin almost sprinted down the stone corridor with a sense of huge urgency that Clara and Sophie had never seen from her. If she was being truthful to herself, Sophie also enjoyed the sprint. It made what they were doing feel even more imperative than it was, and everyone overtook Yasmin in the dash. On the walls next to them on both sides, candles flicked on and off as they shot past, door after door, but still Yasmin didn't stop. If they hadn't been in their avatars, the girls would surely have been out of breath. They were starting to leave Kingsley behind as he insisted on staying as his mythical self and lifted himself off the floor and flew alongside them. Eventually, the group ran past a door but Yasmin, who was at the back, stopped and shouted forwards to everyone who was still running. He'll be in here, Yasmin said confidently. Sophie and Clara looked around, looking for a way that Yasmin could tell exactly where she was and how this door was any different to any of the others they had just ran past, but neither could see any. It was, for all intents and purposes, a door that was identical to the many others. How? What? Where? Clara stuttered, not seeing what Yasmin and Sophie were. Oh, come on, tell me you know where this is. This is the office, Yasmin interrupted enthusiastically. Is it? Clara asked without blinking, still not understanding what she was hearing. How can you tell? Kingsley asked, finally getting his breath back. Every door looks the same here. Look, while you two were off quizzing an Encantado, and you, she said, pointing at Kingsley, were off finding new worlds, I was studying everything in the scope system, and the layout of the building was one of the first things I looked at. Why? Clara asked. As with all the things Yasmin could have looked up, why on earth would she have chosen that? All those rooms. Don't you ever wonder what's in them? Yasmin asked. Sometimes, replied Sophie, still not sharing her friend's enthusiasm, but she was much more fascinated in the mythicals than in the technology. Well, it's come in handy now, hasn't it? Yasmin said, with more than a hint of sarcasm. We'll see, said Sophie, as she went to open the door. As Sophie turned the handle, the four of them saw a very familiar sight, but in a very unusual state. In front of them was a desk made of wood, with beautiful engraved carvings around the edge, and a few papers stored neatly to one side of it. Behind the desk, hung another painting from the family collection they saw earlier. This time, the boy had grown and was quite clearly a young king. The man was still in the picture, but the woman was no longer there. To the side of the now old man's face was a mark on his left cheek. Sophie recognised it as the scratch of a werewolf claw. The man had clearly had a fight or an argument with one, which begged the question to Sophie of what exactly had happened to the woman. Also in the room were two chairs but both had bright light shining down on them, and so the occupants of the chair remained a mystery to them. When Sophie had adjusted the implant's focus, she made out that in one chair was a man with a ginger-scented parting and hair roughly down to his ears. He also wore a pair of bright red thick glasses. This was Dale Nathan, the co-founder of Shadow all those years ago and, until recently, the head teacher at Pinkleton Primary School under the guise of Mr Houghton. On the side of his head, Sophie recognised a time dilator straight away, but didn't study him any further. Slumped in the other chair, behind the desk, and clearly zoned out, was the unmistakable figure of Alton King, who looked a lot older and more unkempt than the last time Sophie had seen him in real life. It did beg the question to Sophie, had she ever actually met the real Alton King? Finally, Sophie saw up against the wall was Miss Sissons. She was tied up, looked very frail and clearly hadn't been fed properly for a few days. She was unconscious, but Sophie could see she was breathing and wondered whether her nutrition chip had been deactivated because of the state she was in. Again, without being prompted, Kingsley opened a portal to scope and Sophie removed the chains Miss Sissons was being held with by using one swipe of her avatar's arm. Clara hoisted the real Miss Sissons up and carried her through the portal back to scope, where avatar Miss Sissons sat her human self down in a chair. When she had done so, she turned to look at her four liberators and thanked them. Lock him up in Zapvor, Miss Sisson said, pointing at Dale Nathan. What you do with him, she continued, now gesturing to King, is entirely up to you. The portal closed and Kingsley set about creating another one to Zapvor and when he had done, he pushed Nathan into a cell. He'll keep for later, Clara said of Nathan, remembering full well that he had put her in the nightmare programme 
and had hidden her and her dads away from Sophie and everyone else for the entire six-week holiday. Sophie nodded in agreement, as did Yasmin, and Kingsley stepped back through his own portal before closing it ready for the next part of the plan. Do you want me to find Manita's location? Yasmin asked. Yes, go, Sophie replied, and Yasmin scurried over to look at King's very old-looking computer. I'll talk you through it, Yas, Miss Sisson said in their ears. It's okay, I think I've got it. I got some practice with one of these in the scope archives, Yasmin replied as she started typing. The remaining three stood round King's zoned-out body and mulled over what to do. They needed to decide quick before he could escape the Kraken and break out of Meliora, potentially with some mythicals in tow. Put him in Zapvor, Kingsley started. Sophie and Clara both shook their heads. That's too easy. He'll have some way of getting out, Sophie replied. Put a time dilator on him and set it for a million years every second, Clara suggested. Sophie shook her head again. He can't be anywhere near anything he's ever built, invented or had a part in. He needs to go somewhere he would hate and he would have no chance of getting out. King sat on his chair breathing deeply. Whatever his avatar was doing was clearly getting him tired and causing him a lot of stress. Give him to the mythicals then, Kingsley suggested. It's their lives he's ruined. Let them decide what should happen to him. Sophie thought about this for a moment and couldn't see a problem with anything Kingsley had suggested. What if they're too harsh? Clara asked. What's too harsh? He has ruined lives of millions to grow his company and cared about nothing but that company, Sophie replied. The three suggested it to Yasmin while she was typing and she agreed with everything they said as well. We can't send him there now. The battle is still ongoing, Kingsley explained. Can't we? Sophie asked. He'd love to be in something that he created. How ironic is it that he would find himself in the middle of the battlefield, in the mythical country that he inadvertently created? That and he won't be able to zone out, as everything there is under mythical control. He would just be his normal human self. Kingsley and Clara instantly liked this idea, and Kingsley immediately opened another portal to Meliora. He, Sophie and Clara pulled the zoned out king through and looked around. The carnage was unprecedented. Two of the zones, the desert and the polar, had fallen in on each other and the Manita copies were still zooming round inflicting damage on anything and everything they could find. Creatures lay stricken on the floor while others charged round still trying to get hold of the three teenagers. I can't see Echidna, Kingsley shouted over the deafening sound of the battle. Go and find her and help in any way you can. We've got this here, Sophie replied, as she and Clara pushed King's feet into Meliora. Kingsley nodded and ran off to find Echidna, closing the portal in the process and leaving human King's zoned out body on the Meliora floor. Instantly, the noise from the battle stopped and the three girls now worked in King's office all alone. Clara and Sophie looked at each other and breathed the temporary sigh of relief at the job that was now at least partly done. Next step was finding where Manita actually was and stop her. After a few button presses, Found her! shouted Yasmin from the computer. That was quick, Clara replied. Well, us school counsellors have to work hard, Yasmin said with a smile. Sophie grinned and rolled her eyes as the respite was so short-lived and Yasmin was excellent at working on the computers. Sophie Hardy Saga was written and produced by Emma Dale and narrated and produced by Leona Hall. If you enjoyed it and would like to continue to follow the adventures of Sophie and her friends in coming episodes, then please subscribe through one of the many podcast providers out there. The links for each of these can be found on our website. If you require more information, visit our many social media channels, or if you would like to purchase a copy of the book, then be sure to check out our website, www.sophiehardysaga.com. Thank you for listening and we hope you enjoy. Ha <laughs> ha